Hello, I'm Jacob Lee, and I'm 16 years old and was diagnosed with adolescent idiopathic scoliosis at the age of 13. Today, I'd like to introduce Luke Steichweather, the founder, president, and chief orthotist of the National Scoliosis Center, located in Baltimore, Maryland, and Fairfax, Virginia. Luke has made over 5,000 scoliosis braces, including mine, and he has a 90% success rate. Thank you so much for taking the time to participate in today's interview. Yes, absolutely, Jacob. Thanks for the opportunity to share uh, our passion for scoliosis. Um, as, you knew, as you know, Luke, um, we met over two years ago to construct my Rigo Chanel brace for my 53 degree curve. Um, I've always been interested uh, in engineering and how certain products are made to solve problems in the world. And I was hoping to explore the engineering behind scoliosis bracing and in doing so, I'll start with my first question, which is, um, from a biomechanical perspective, how does scoliosis develop in the spine? How does it get worse? And why does it need to be treated? So there are different types of scoliosis, as you might know. Um, the type that we're dealing with most of the time is what's called idiopathic scoliosis. At the root, that word idio, from the original Latin, means up unknown, so essentially without knowledge is what it means. So historically speaking, it's been called idiopathic, but more recently in the last five, 10 years, we clearly see a genetic element to that, that this is in essence is taking place right from the beginning, XY chromosomes coming together, making a unique individual, and oh well, sorry, but part of that may be that you got scoliosis. Um, there's not a clear pathway. They are still mapping those genes, still trying to figure that out. And then something happens as a triggering mechanism, and then it expresses itself, and it's expressing itself based on its unique program to be a small curve, a large curve, a single curve, a double curve, a triple curve, to be a right or left curve. But then other factors start to take over as it's expressing itself. But the mechanics of it are that when we start to have a scoliosis, we're going from having a symmetrical body, typically speaking, right, left, um, alignment of the head over the spine, over the pelvis, to starting to see these asymmetries occurring. And when asymmetries start to happen, one side might be growing at a little different rate than the other. You may have a difference in the length of musculature and soft tissue elements, so that over time, bone forms under loads. And so from a mechanical standpoint, loading on one side of a vertebrae creates compression, while the tension on the other side allows for growth to happen. So eventually, instead of being somewhat rectangular, like a block, a building block, the vertebrae can actually start to become pie or wedge shaped. And so then that creates a structural component to that scoliosis. So that's why what we're doing is so important to catch this in an earlier phase and try to reverse that asymmetrical loading and that cycle that vicious cycle of progression. And Ian Stokes hypothesized that if you could do that, you would see improvement occur. That's why I think we are successful as much as we are in seeing curves that are stable and or improving. I'm also curious to know, in regards to problem solving, how is the Rigo Chanel brace engineered to provide a solution to the problem of scoliosis progression? So Rigo Chanel is a brace that we've been using roughly since 2004 in North America. And it comes down to knowing how to properly apply the loads for correcting the curvatures or applying corrective movements that help the curvatures reduce when the brace is being worn. So when it comes to engineering terms that you're interested in, we talk about force, vector, and loads. But the Rigo Chanel is what we refer to as a 3D brace because it really is addressing that complete um, issue with scoliosis of derotation, translation, elongation. So elongation is that upward lifting kind of as I'm doing right now so that I'm 
counteracting the impact of gravity that wants to pull me down. And so that we can get the curvatures in the spine to get some elongation in the process of bracing. So when we can load that, we can get a muscular soft tissue response over time. So we talk about the concept of incremental loading a little bit, a little bit more and a little bit more common to what you might understand as orthodontic bracing. So the orthodontist gets them on, comes back, tweaks them in six weeks, comes back, tweaks them again. If we could do that for every patient on some regular frequency, I think we'd even have better results. Uh, so what's unique about the Riga Cheneau is that it has probably in a group of braces that is more effective than historically other braces have been. And for us, there's nothing else out there currently that we have found that we're interested in using. That doesn't mean that there aren't other good braces. And certainly we have colleagues around the world uh, that have other results as good as ours are with um, other braces from Europe and elsewhere. So it really comes down to a depth of knowledge and understanding on the part of the orthotist to be able to design, build, and apply an appropriate brace for each patient to get optimal results for that patient. Um, Luke, I remember when I came to see you a while back, um, you assessed my scoliosis and measured me for my brace. And I even got to help construct my own brace and got to see a little bit of the construction process firsthand. So going off of what you said earlier about um, the variation of material that were used for the braces, um, how is the selection of materials important and how does it impact the production process of the brace as well as the patient and their experience using the brace? Great question, Jacob. Um, historically speaking, as you go through old references, you'll find braces made out of metal and leather. And so through the Middle Ages and the heyday of that type of bracing, they were coming up with all kinds of contraptions and devices trying to uh, treat scoliosis. They didn't have plastics. Plastics didn't come into being particularly for our field of orthotics and prosthetics until the early 70s. And with the advances in plastic, we moved away from metal and leather. Uh, the advances in plastics have given us more options to be able to shape and contour something to the body that's a little bit more cosmetically acceptable to the patient, that hygienically is easier to clean, um, that can apply these forces and can be easily adjusted if it's applying forces in the wrong place or in an uncomfortable way. So plastic tends to be the uh, material of choice since about the early 70s all the way up until current times. Um, there are some advances going on right now in technology, particularly around 3D printing. And as the materials for 3D printing continue to evolve, and experimentation is done, I have no doubt that we'll come up with better options. We've actually already fit several 3D printed braces. The materials tend to be a little bit rigid, a little bit difficult to adjust and to work with. So it's not quite there uh, in its um, initial applications. I fully expect that we will get there, that we'll get the right material. Again, probably a plastic. This is an extruded material. So when you're 3D printing something, it's called additive construction. So you're heating or putting an element of a plastic or something material and building around and around over time. Uh, so I, I think there'll be some advances. But for the moment, uh, the current process of the heat formable plastics and the group that we use is typically within the polypropylene family called polyolefins, unique properties that can be easily heated and formed over a mold. So thermoforming is what you did when you were here and what we continue to do where we're playing, putting a piece of flat plastic in the oven and heating it to a temperature and then pulling it out draping it around the model of the patient body. And then that's being vacuum formed in to get the exact shape we want with abilities to modify and, and change that uh, one way or the other over time as they're wearing that. Um, like I mentioned earlier, considering that all your regression braces are specifically made for each patient in their specific form of scoliosis, um, what factors do you need to consider in order to satisfy 
your patient's needs and our wants um, when designing these braces? Yeah, that's challenging for sure. Each individual is unique as they are in their height, weight, hair color, and personalities. And their curves, as much as we deal with curves, and there are certain types of curves in terms of tendencies towards patterns, whether those are patterns for the left or the right, doubles. And the nice thing about what Dr. Rigo has done is to classify scoliosis for us that makes it real easy. So when we look at an x-ray and we look at a patient, we're assessing them and in our mind coming up with what we think will be the best appropriate brace design to address their unique curve pattern, their curve size, magnitudes. And we're also looking at them, the variability of, is this a flexible patient that has good mobility that easily can shift and correct? Or is this someone that's a little bit uh, more stiff and rigid? How old is this patient? Can they tolerate good pressure? Uh, there is a tremendous uh, difficulty with sensitive patients. And so thinner patients with less natural padding around them tend to be more sensitive and we have to spend extra time trying to make sure the brace fits and is comfortable and that um, they can tolerate the pressures that we need to apply to get the job done. So it's, it's really the variability of each patient that makes the job challenging and then requires the level of expertise to know how to uniquely address not only the fit of the brace and the comfort of the brace, but also the appearance of the brace, something that they would be willing to wear and accept how it looks. So we're dealing with those elements of trying to get the optimal fit, the best function, great comfort, and cosmesis, how it looks that will be acceptable to them in order to try to get, again, a optimal outcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you again for taking the time to participate in this interview, as well as um, share your knowledge about um, scoliosis bracing and give a little insight about the engineering side of scoliosis. Yes, and I actually um, went diving for you on the element of biomechanics and scoliosis, so I have several articles to forward to you, uh, links that you can check out to get a little bit more understanding of the biomechanical principles. Thank you. That would be great. Jacob, great to see you. Thanks very much. Thank you.